Hello and welcome to today's lesson looking at stellar classes in the astrophysics option of AQA A-level physics. In today's lesson we're going to try and understand the, spe the spectral classification of stars. So if we're successful and we learn in today's lesson we can understand the importance of Barmer lines, the spectral classification, understand how stars can be classified according to their spectra and classify stars into a spectral class based on their properties, which links into the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification for the astrophysics option, the principles of the use of spe stellar spectral classes. Now, as mentioned previously, stars act as black body radiators. This means they emit all forms of radiation. This indicates that all stars should have a continuous emission spectrum as they are emitting everything. So you should be observing a continuous spectrum for a star. However, when we observe stars, we do not actually see this. We see emission and absorption absorption spectra. This is due to a property in the atoms which was covered in the particles module. So when electrons move down different electron energy levels, they de-excite and they release a photon of the corresponding energy level difference. So if we consider an atom with an excited electron in the fourth shell, okay, as mentioned as mentioned previously, electrons in atoms, including in those of in the atmosphere of stars, must occupy certain electron levels or shells. Shells. Now, if it's in the fourth elect, it's in the fourth energy level. This electron can de-excite to either the third, the second, or the first shell or the ground state. It'll always eventually end up in the lowest shell with the vacancy in it. Now, if we consider the transition from the fourth shell to the third shell, when the electron drops to the in the down the atom, it releases a particle of energy, a photon, and the energy of the photon is the difference between the two energy levels they transit between. Now, we can then use the energy and wave equations to calculate the wavelength of the photon released, as it can be also considered a wave because of wave particle duality, so you can work out the wavelength of this photon. Now, this is true for all possible transitions in an excited atom. Each will release a photon of different energy and therefore wavelength, depending on the difference of the energy levels. So, for example, you could have uh, elect photons with energies of 4 EV, 6 EV and 11 EV, so therefore have wavelengths of 3.1 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, 2.1 times 10 to 7 meters and 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Now the energy and wavelengths of photons emitted by the atom is called the emission spectrum. These, these will be lines of radiation for the different possible transitions in the atom. So this is a simplified version of the previous example. It doesn't include all the possible transitions of the atom only the ones from the valence level so this is very important because the different wavelengths of energy which can be absorbed by the atom is the same principle and it's called the absorption spectrum because it's the same for when photons are absorbed by the atom to excite the electrons up the energy levels so the absorption and the emission spectrum of each element is unique and so therefore can be used to identify elements when we are unsure of the contents of a substance so the colored lines on the emission spectrum are are the wavelengths of energy given out by an excited helium atom in this context and the black lines on the absorption spectrum are the wavelengths of energy taken in to excite the helium atom. It was noticed that sunlight had an identical spectrum to helium and this allowed us to work out that helium was present in the sun. So like mentioned before, each line in a line spectrum is due to, the, due to a light photon of a certain wavelength. The photons which produce each line all have the same energy, which is different from the energy the photons produce in any other line. Each photon is then emitted when an, an atom de-excites due to the electrons moving down the shell, and if the electron moves down from E1 to E2, then the energy of the photon emitted is the difference between the energy levels, and we can link it into wavelength by saying this energy is equal to h times by c over lambda. So this means the greater the energy level difference, the shorter the wavelength and higher the frequency of the photon emitted or absorbed. So the largest energy level difference in an atom produces the photon of the shortest wavelength. So it means the smaller the energy level difference, the longer the wavelength or the lower the frequency of the photon, or, uh, which is either emitted or absorbed. So the smallest energy level difference in the atom produces the photon of the longest wavelength. So each possible de-excitation 
rotation between energy levels in an atom corresponds to the emission of one specific frequency of, of a photon from the atomic structure. So it results in one line in the element's emission spectrum. So three lines in hydrogen spectrum are shown here, along with the three energy jumps they correspond to. So the number of possible jumps gives you the number of possible lines in the spectrum. So the number of possible jumps will give you the idea or in the same principle for de-excitation of cascading downwards. So the emission spectrum is unique for elements as each element has different energy levels. So we'll have different energy level differences. So this means they'll emit photons at different frequencies. And the frequency of the photon absorption due to energy level differences is due to the energy difference between the energy levels that the photon ex excites between. It's the same principle. So in this particular idea, the three lines in hydrogen spectrum are shown here with the three energy jumps they correspond to. So the absorption spectrum is determined as the photons as the photons produced when excitation can occur in the atom. So the emission spectrum is unique for elements as each element has different energy levels, so different energy level differences, so it will absorb photons at different frequencies. So you've got emission spectrum, which is caused by de-excitation when the atom emits photons, and the, the absorption spectrum is caused by excitation when the atom absorbs photons. Both are caused by electrons moving between energy levels. The emission spectrum is when the energy... Um the electrons move down in the energy levels, whilst absorption is caused with the electrons moving up in energy levels. Now, spectra are also experimental proof for the particle nature of light, in addition to the photoelectric effect and the ultraviolet catastrophe. So just remember this is a very, very important idea that the emission spectrum and the absorption spectrum link to the energy level differences. So as the line spectra of each element is unique, due to each element having different energy levels, you can identify identify which elements are present in a sample because you can excite a sample of a substance, let the sample de-excite and record its emission spectrum, compare the emission spectrum with known samples, then find the matching element from the matching sample. It doesn't matter where the sample is excited, the line spectrum will always be the same. So we can determine the elements in a star like the sun by observing its line spectra and comparing it to known element line spectra produced in the lab, or the same for supernovae, we can work out what what uh, elements are found in a supernovae by observing its line spectra and comparing it to known element line spectra produced in the lab. We can also determine if an object is red shifting or blue shifting by comparing its line spectra to a sample line spectra produced in the lab. So now hydrogen is the, is the element used as, the reference, as a reference marker since it's the most common element in the universe. Now it's very important for hydrogen, for a hydrogen absorption line to occur in the visible part of the spectrum, the electrons need to be in the n equals 2 state. Now absorption occurs when the atom gains energy and the electrons move up levels. The absorption lines in the visible hydrogen spectrum occur when the electrons in the n equals 2 two uh, st uh, energy level move up energy levels. So these series of absorption lines are called the Barmer series. So the Barmer lines are seen in all, speller, in all stellar spectra where light emitted by the star has been absorbed by hydrogen atoms in the stellar atmosphere as the radiation passes through it. So the Barmer lines are the absorption lines of hydrogen found in the visible spectrum of radiation. This was really important when the only only telescopes we could use in astronomy were the optical ones. Now, the particles in the cores of stars do not contain electrons, so it's only the atoms in the atmospheres of stars which do this. So the Barmer lines only give an indication of the surface properties of a star, not its core properties. Now, as Barmer lines only occur at n equals 2, this is an excited state. This means that the atoms must be at a high temperature where collisions between the atoms give the electrons additional energy. Now, if the temperature is too high, the majority of the electrons will be in the n equals 3 state, so there's not many Barmer lines produced. So the intensity of the Barmer lines depends on the temperature of the star, and when I mean star, I mean the atmosphere of the star. Now when the electrons de-excite, the light is emitted in all directions, and the electrons may do it in several steps, or miss out n equals 2 and jump down to n equals 1. This results in the gap or the reduction in intensity in the direction of the observer. So, if we consider uh, the hydrogen 
hydrogen absorption spectrum. If the temperature is too high, the majority of the electrons with the n equals 3 states, you don't have many Balmer lines produced. The intensity of the Balmer lines will go down. So here, most electrons in the n equals 3 state, very few Balmer lines. Here, most electrons in the n equals 1 state, very few Balmer lines. But here, most electrons in the n equals 2 state, many Balmer lines, because the temperature corresponds to just enough energy for those atoms to be excited so their electrons in the n equals 2 state. Now, the stars were originally classified in order of Balmer line intensity. So A was the most intense lines, then B and C corresponding to that line strength. However, it was then realized years later that this didn't correlate with temperature due to the idea of n equals 1 and n equals 3. However, by this point, the spectral class system had already been established. So this means we had to reorder the spectral classes in order of temperature so they were no longer they were no longer in alphabetical order they were now in a different order so this is why the spectral classes are not in alphabetical order so you can use the intensity of Balmer lines to find the temperature of a star. For a particular intensity of Balmer lines, two temperatures are possible, as you can see by the curved nature of the graph. So to get around this, you've got to look at the absorption lines of other atoms and molecules. So we can classify atoms as well as looking at Balmer lines by looking at the relative strength of absorption lines of different elements and other substances. So this means that this means for stars with temperatures outside Balmer line transitions, we use the absorption lines of other elements as shown in these particular diagrams. Now as the surface temperature of the star affects the absorption line production, there is a link between the surface temperature of the star and the spectral class. And again, as the surface temperature determines the colour of the star, there is a link between the colour of the star and its spectral class. Now the relationship between temperature and spectra is due to the effect of the energy on the state of the atoms or molecules. At low temperatures, there may not be enough energy to excite atoms atoms or break molecular bonds resulting in the titanium oxide and neutral atoms in those particular stars. At higher temperatures, atoms have too much energy to form molecules and ionization can take place. And the abundance of hydrogen and helium in the atmosphere of the hottest stars means that their spectral lines start to dominate. So this is where the hydrogen Balmer series is a useful indicator. So here are the different spectral classes you must memorize for your examination. You've got the O class stars, which have a blue color and a temperature in Kelvin between 25,000 and 50,000. The absorption lines are in the helium ion and the helium uh, atom and they have weak Balmer lines because most of the atoms are in the N equals 3 state. Um, there's class B, which is a blue colour, temperature between 11,000 and 25,000 Kelvin, with absorption lines in helium and the Balmer lines, again because most of the electrons in the atom are at the right temperature in the N equals 2 state. You then got the class A star, which is a blue-white colour, and has a temperature between 7,500 and 11,000 Kelvin. This has very strong Balmer lines because this temperature correlates to many of the electrons in the atoms of the atmospheric hi uh, hydrogen being in the N equals 2 state. You've then got class F, which is white, and this is now a bit cooler at 6,000 to 7,500 Kelvin, with the absorption lines being metal ions, because it's cooler, so ions can now form. This means that white dwarf stars actually have a higher surface temperature than red giant and main sequence stars. This occurs as the intensity of their emission is so large because their surface area is so small. You've then got class G, which are yellow-white in colour, and they have a temperature between 6,000 and 7,500, and the absorption lines are metal ions and metal atoms, which is the class the sun is currently in. You've got class K, which are orange in colour, and have a temperature between 3,500 and 5,000 Kelvin, with absorption lines in the neutral metal atoms. Then you've got class M, which are red in colour, have a temperature of less than 3,500, and have absorption lines, which have neutral atoms and molecules like titanium titanium oxide because these stars are cool enough for molecules to form in their atmospheres. So this means that red giant stars actually have the lowest surface temperature of all stars. This because this occurs as their intensity of emission is so low because their surface area is so large. So the stellar class system from hottest to coolest goes O, B, A, F, G, K, N. Now a mnemonic you, to remember the order could be O, B, a fine girl kiss me or O, B, a fine guy kiss me or it could be only bad astronomers forget generally known mnemonics. 
Okay, and since the original classification, further cooler stars have been discovered in given classes, but they're not required for A-level physics. So here's an illustration of the different spectral classes we find in the galaxy. Now we can place the stars in order of these spectral classes in a diagram, which we call the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which we'll cover in the next lesson. And here is the stellar, stellar class classification. You've got to learn all these properties for your examination. So you must be able to estimate temperature and color if you are given a spectral class of a star, and you must be able to recognize a class if you are given an absorption spectrum. So it's very important you memorize this key information. Now, remember the color change links with the temperature due to Vine's displacement law. So the reason why our O type stars are blue and our N class stars are red links to their surface temperature from Vine's displacement law. Now we can also classify the stars according to their Balmer lines. So O have very weak and B are slightly stronger because the star's atmosphere is too hot. The hydrogen is likely to be ionized. A has the strongest uh, prominence of Balmer lines because there's a high abundance of hydrogen atoms in the n equals 2 state whilst we go f is a bit cooler so the hydrogen is unlikely to be excited in the n equals 2 state whilst g k and m there's very little atomic hydrogen and so it's far too cool to be excited so you'll get no Balmer lines present so if we have learned in today's lesson we should be able to uh, have a description of the main stellar classes linking this into the spectral class with the intrinsic color the temperature and the prominent absorption lines of the star and understand that temperature is related to absorption spectra limited to hydrogen Balmer lines and you must have your atom in the n equals 2 state for you to observe a hydrogen Balmer line. So if you've been successful and you've learned in today's lesson, you understand the importance of Balmer lines to spectral classification, you understand how stars can be classified according to their spectra, and you can classify stars into spectral class based on their properties. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on spectral classes and have a lovely day.